Good evening, everyone. I'm Leonore, and in behalf of the Student Affairs Group of the Psychological Society of Ireland and the Psychological Society here in Trinity College, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's talk. Our guest speaker is a very accomplished man. In fact, when I first met him, he was being awarded the Distinguished Investigator Award by Neuroscience Ireland. And um, if I'm to give you a list of all his accomplishments, we'll be here all night. So apologies if this introduction can't give justice to his vast expertise and experience. So John comes all the way from New York, but he's originally from Dublin and has remained a dub. He's remained Irish at heart. He's a professor of pediatrics and neuroscience at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He is the Director of Research at the Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center. He is the Director of the Einstein Autism Center of Excellence. And if that's not enough, he's also the Associate Director of the Rose F. Kennedy Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. He's also kept his Irish ties. He's an adjunct professor here in Trinity College at the Psychology Department. And He's also the new co-editor-in-chief of the journal Frontiers in Human Neuroscience and an associate editor of the journal Frontiers in Brain Imaging Methods. And he's the director of the Cognitive Neurophysiology Lab, and research in his lab focuses on understanding the biological basis of developmental disorders with a specific emphasis on autism. His lab already has several publications arising out of their work, which will eventually contribute to the development of effective treatments and interventions. This evening, we're going to hear all about it. And he's a very busy man with a lot of responsibilities. I don't know how he does it, but um, somehow I managed to twist his arm, his arm to give a talk to us when he's home. So thanks, John. And we're very privileged to have him here this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor John Fox. Thank you very much, Leonor, for that very kind introduction. Um, so uh, I'll, I'm going to dive right in. Um, and it is a huge privilege to be here speaking to you this evening. I'm extremely impressed with... Uh, in the people who come out at 7 p.m. on a Friday evening to hear some old scientist go on about work that he's done, but uh, we'll try our best. I'm going to uh, try and cover four general areas, and I, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to front load the talk a little bit with the with the with the science piece so while you're still here, still awake, uh, and then I will move into things that maybe will be a little bit more accessible. Uh, I know that there's uh, a vast differences in experience with, with science. So the stuff at the beginning will be a little heavy. Bear with me. It's kind of important to get some of the basic concepts about how the brain integrates sight, sound, and touch before we can really move into sensibly talking about what might be going on in autism, dyslexia, and other developmental disorders. Um, so I'll talk a, a bit about uh, evidence for early feed-forward mechanisms and multisensory integration. I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I'm going to just pick one piece of the puzzle, for example, you know, what's the role of space uh, in, uh, in when you're integrating multisensory information? Does it matter if the sight and the sound, for example, come from the same place out there? You guys know about the ventriloquist illusion, for example. Talk about ways in which the brain organizes this kind of information. And then we'll move into uh, uh, some of the clinical aspects of things. I'll show you quite a lot of data in um, individuals on the autism spectrum uh, and some difficulties that might be being had there with, with putting together sight and sound. Uh, and then move to some functional neuroimaging data towards the end that maps out the multisensory networks in the brain and then asks in children with dyslexia what's going on in those networks. Is there something a little different going on there? Because we, we take a very strong <coughs> position that dyslexia is a very spe specific deficit in multisensory integration and learning the correspondences between sight and sound. It stands to reason you read and conjure auditory images. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, I want to do this, get this out of the way, if you will, before I start, because I don't want to forget. These are, uh, you don't get to do all this work without uh, lots of people uh, involved really doing the hard work. I get to swan around the world and give talks. That's nice, uh, but these people sit back in New York doing it. That's, uh, that's uh, 
Oops. Uh, by myself. This is Lars Ross. Uh, he's a professor at the Delphi University now. He's, he's German originally. He did quite a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about with multisensory speech integration. Young Kyung Kim, uh, he's from Korea. She's a, a senior postdoc in our lab. Has done most of the functional imaging work I'll show you. This is Alice Brandwine torturing a child here. Uh, this is her own child. We don't allow her to do that to other people's children. Uh, and she's done quite a lot of our multisensory electrophysiology in autism which we'll talk about. That's Sophie Malholm, who's my partner in crime. She's uh, the, the co-director of my lab. Ian Feeblecorn, who's now down as an assistant professor at Princeton, who did quite a lot of work on the multisensory object recognition. So those are five individuals that really deserve specific mention. Uh, but it's a large lab, and a lot of people are involved. So this is, the, this is most of the team there. Uh, Good-looking folks. So, so let's talk about uh, this concept of feed-forward integration. Let me ask you a question really quickly. I mean... Uh, how many people, but show of hands, have formal training in neuroscience, neuroanatomy, or anything like that? All right, and the rest of you, I assume, don't. So I'm just, it's, it'll help me to calibrate here a little bit. So, so let me tell you something about the way uh, the brain's uh, arranged. And, and this is really like a, a boxological diagram, if you like. You know, so information flows in through the retina and the eye and in through the, the basilar membrane and the ear, the hair cells, and so on. And it flows on up into cortical regions into your brain. And the brain is organized into, into these modules, little brain areas that feed one into the next, going from simple to more complex types of analysis. And that's almost good enough to know. Um, and that, so that's painting in broad strokes. And so, for example, here's V1, the first visual area, V2, the second visual area, and so on. This V++ here actually represents, we've identified to date, 42 specific regions in visual cortex that do different types of processes, analyzing color, analyzing motion. All that information is broken out, analyzed in separate brain areas, and then put back together, bound back together. So there's Neuroscience 101 uh, in three seconds. Uh, and, and lo and behold, the auditory system does something quite similar. There's a primary auditory area. There's actually three of them. We'll skip over that. Uh, there are areas further up the system and so on. So there's a complex serial hierarchy, if you like, of areas going from simple to more complex. And the way people have put it, so, so you think, okay, well, I don't just hear things and I don't just see things. I put those things together. We're multisensory perceptual devices. Uh, and the way people, for really for decades and centuries, con conceived of this process of binding together auditory and visual information was something akin to this. It's the idea that there are, at the very top of the hierarchy, quite late in processing, after the visual system's kind of got done doing its business, and the auditory system's got done doing its business, you're going to integrate the information in these higher order regions. It's like they sit up at the top of the hierarchy before, if you like, you get to formal part. And again, I'm painting in broad strokes here. And so this is, this is called a late integrationist model. Uh, and this, is the pre this was the predominant model for really for, for uh, most of, of uh, the history of neuroscience. Now, there is an alternative to this. Um, and that is that uh, perhaps what actually happens is that much earlier in the system, these regions are wired up to each other, that the auditory and the visual system are wired up, and that they don't do it separately and then integrate, but they actually do it together right from the get-go, more like percolating up the system, if you like. Uh, and that, that uh, for a number of theoretical reasons, that was something that we thought had to be the case. Uh, and one really simple way to think about this is, Imagine I were to present to you a very bright flash, really bright flash. Uh, it, what happens with things that are really bright and fast is that they, they fly up through the system. They're bright and fast. They activate the system really, really uh, strongly. And in fact, if you record in these areas, stick electrodes in there, you'll find that information is traveling very, very quickly through this. But there's no necessary natural relationship between something really bright or big or fast moving and loudness. So, for example, I could take a stroboscopic flash, the classic thing that we would use in a lab, and flash a really, really uh, bright flash, and it would make a little as the gas goes off. So, it's very little, very light sound. Well, what do you think happens when something uh, that doesn't, that's really just barely there uh, occurs? It goes quite slowly through this system. It takes quite a while for it to build up uh, activity and activate your system. So you have this situ situation where if you wait around till late, some stuff might be moving very quickly through the system, very slowly through the system, 
And then other things happen. It's not like in a lab where we just present one stimulus. But in the world, things are happening all the time. There's a cacophony of, of inputs coming in. So some stuff might be moving quickly, some stuff moving slowly, other stuff may be passing other things out in that system for all we know. And that. So, so we took the position, you can't wait. You, it couldn't be the case. It's a computationally uh, um, improbable thing that the system waits too late to put the information together. It must be tagging the information early. And so we pitched out the idea that, in fact, there's communication between these areas uh, much earlier. So I actually made these two slides uh, before PowerPoint, in fact, back in the early 90s. Uh, and I've kept them ever since, they, just to remind me where we've come from. Uh, now, there's a reason why the late model held for many, many years, and, and this is it. So for decades, it was believed that connections between the early sensory regions and the respective sensory modalities didn't exist. So here, here's a quote from Jones and Powell. Jones and Powell were very, very famous neuroanatomists at Oxford. And of course, uh, as Irish people, we like to make fun of uh, people at Oxford. Uh, and here's what they said. In this, uh, in, and this is just one example of, you, you find this in basically every neuroanatomy textbook. You'll still find it in neuroanatomy textbooks. However, the primary somatic that's touched Visual and auditory cortices are not interconnected and each projects to very restricted and entirely separate fields, chiefly in their immediate vicinity. Thank you. It makes no sense. <laughs> but this, is, this was the state of knowledge. So, so, so you'll see, actually, I, when I originally drew this slide, I put these dotted lines in here. And that's the reason they were dotted, is because there was no evidence that these things existed. And actually, there was a lot of evidence that they didn't exist. And so, so what started to happen was, Around uh, the year 1999, 2000, with the advent of functional imaging. So functional imaging came in the early 90s. In fact, uh, the, unfortunately, the, the guy who invented it, Jack Belliveau, died last week. He's a very good friend of mine. Uh, but what, what happened was uh, people began to use... It was quite difficult to use the systems to study sensory systems. It was hard to get the, get the uh, stimuli into the magnet. And certainly to do multi-sensory experiments was quite difficult. So it took, it took a few years before people started to do this. And what they were finding was uh, they were, if you'd like, they were operating with this late integrationist model. And they were looking for these higher order multi-sensory integration regions. And what they would find is that they do audio-visual studies, auditory somatosensory studies, and early sensory regions, those early regions were lighting up. And they said, like, what's going on here? Why are these early regions lighting up? And so the preferred explanation was this. They said, not surprisingly then, the explanation preferred for multi-sensory effects that were showing up in these early sensory regions in these hemodynamic imaging studies. So hemodynamic, this is the neuroimaging, functional imaging, uh, was that these modulations must surely represent feedback input subsequent to initial multisensory processing in higher order regions. So this is Gemma Calvert, who was working at Oxford at the time, Andy King. And, um, so what, what does that mean? Well, one of the things is when you do functional neuroimaging, when you measure blood flow, well, you're measuring the plumbing of the brain. The electrical activity is very, very quickly, very, operates very, very quickly, but the blood flow that goes in then to feed those areas, to replenish oxygen, glucose, uh, it's, it's plumbing, it moves, it's mechanical, it's moving through pipes, if you like, through the capillary beds, and so it's quite slow. So you have no measure of the timing of information flow when you use functional imaging. So I'll show you what that looks like. So, so here, here's the study I, I did uh, back at that time. Um, and now, what we're doing here is a very, very simple thing. We have people in the magnet, and we're presenting sounds to them, and we're presenting touch on the fingertips. And then we present the two together. Uh, and we were using very, very sophisticated stimulation devices. So what we had was a rolling pin with some <laughs> sandpaper on the end of it and a big, long wooden dowel to a handle, home, homemade, uh, that one of my technicians, Beth Higgins, uh, would, would turn. And what happened was then we would project through the window of the, of the magnet room an arrow on the wall that would go back and forth. And I told her that she went this way and she went this way and so on. So it was, it, was, it was the early days of, of neuroimaging. And so the sandpaper slides across the fingers, and, uh, uh, and so you get a nice somatosensory response. And what we did then was, at one point, we recorded the sound of the sandpaper sliding over the fingers, so it sounded a bit like... <laughs> so, uh, so we're playing that sound to them as well. So when we play the sound, we get activation of the auditory cortices. So there's the front of the brain, the back of the brain. This is the supratemporal plane. We're going to end up learning quite a bit about that here. 
And so this is, this is activation of all those areas, A1, and all the surrounding areas in what's called the ba belt and the parabelt region. And then when we, push, when we do the, sa the sandpaper thing, we activate, this is actually the somatosensory strip here, post-central gyrus. And actually, for those of you who know, that's the motor cortex there, because the people can't help pushing back a little bit. They can't help just, just you know, it's this thing sliding over the fingers, so they're pushing back, so we get their motor cortex as well. And this, is, this is left hemisphere. This is left hemisphere, yeah. So we're... we're so we're presenting to the right, we're presenting to the right ear and the right finger. And so, so then what, you, what we do here is we just say, okay, what lit up over here and over here? What, what lit up in both cases? And that turns out to be this region here at the back of auditory cortex. So if I take a slice through here, this is what's called Heschel's jars. This is the auditory cortex. And right in the back of it, there's an area that's sensitive to both somatosensory and auditory input. And that's, at the time, that area shouldn't be there. It should, this is not where people, the late integrationist people, were expecting to see these multisensory interactions. So that was a clue to us that, you know what, there may be some of this connectivity at these early levels, and we need to be thinking about that. But we're stuck with the same problem here, and that is because this is the plumbing. We don't know that the activity in this area didn't happen a second later, half a second later. We, we have no way to say when it happened because the, the response we're measuring is just too sluggish. So we need to get a little bit quicker. So the way to do that, of course, is, I mean, the brain's an electrical device. So they, and this is one of the key things, you know, functional imaging, and you'll see it in the newspapers uh, uh, all the time, makes for really lovely, pretty pictures like you just saw. Uh, but, and, and it's very powerful, and I'll show you some ways in which it's very powerful. But in, in the end of the day, you're actually not measuring what the brain does. Uh, what the brain is, is an electrical device. And if you want to really know what the brain is doing, you have to measure the electrical potentials in the brain. So we can do that uh, very simply in humans. You'll see this is it's a little clockwork orange, but I'm sure you've all seen this. So here's, here's uh, Franzi, who's one of the guys who works in the lab. Uh, he, he's actually at the University of Glasgow now. Um, and uh, he's got a lot of electrodes on his scalp surface. So we can record the brain's response whenever we stimulate him. Uh, and it gives us really exquisite temporal information. And because we're putting a lot of these electrodes on, we can make some inferences about where inside the brain events are occurring. So here we have fantastic temporal information. Not so good on space, because we're outside. We can't really get in, into his brain. He's not, not keen on that. Um, <laughs> and so, so now what we do is I'm going to take the design I just did uh, and present auditory information, somatosensory information, and... Every now and again, I'll present auditory and somatosensory information, sound and touch, together. And I'm asking a very simple question here. If I take the response of the brain to audition, to, the, to hearing, and I take the response of the brain to touch, and I add those responses together, do, does that artificial response look different than when the two events actually occurred together? Is the brain doing something different when they occur together as opposed to when the two happen separately? And you can do this with voltage because it, it's just a biophysical principle. So it's a simple addition. This is as difficult as the math's going to get here. Uh, and so here, this is actually the, the, somatic, this is the stimulation here at zero. So you're going to see a few of these kinds of plots. And so let me unpack it for you. So this is voltage, the amplitude of the brain's response. And this is time. Zero is when we stimulate. And then this is time ticking by here, but it's not much time. This is 120 milliseconds, just over a tenth of a second. The brain's very fast. It needs to be very fast. You need to jump out of the way. We were just coming across Nassau Street. You want to be fast out there. <laughs> um, so so what, you, what you can do is you can follow the response. This is actually, in this case, the somatosensory stimulus is a little uh, pulse of electricity on the wrist. Um, an electroshock. No, it's a pulse of electricity. So... So we simulate there, and time goes by, and you can see by about just 20 milliseconds there's a response in, in the cortex, in the brain. 20 milliseconds. 20 thousandths of one second. And then what you see here in the green trace, which is really right there behind the blue trace, that's when we add up the auditory and the somatosensory response. And the blue trace is when the two things came together. And you can see that very, very quickly, these traces don't look the same. They look the same for a little period of time, and then they don't look the same. And so if I just subtract them, this red trace is actually the, the difference between them. And so what happens is, by about 40 to 50 milliseconds, that means a vanishingly small amount of time, this brain already knows the difference between a multisensory and a unisensory stimulus. stimulus. Very, very fast. This is, cru this is crucial to function. And, and, uh, and when we published this, uh, 
you know, I guess 13 years ago. Uh, this, this caused a big, a big start. People didn't buy this, and again, because you, everybody's locked into this late integrationist mode. So how multi-sensory effects have no business showing up this early. Okay. Well, artifacts, you know, everything. I'm screaming. Scientists are very polite people until, <laughs> until something like this happens. And then you had a, I was at a conference in Geneva, for example, where there was literally a walkout of one of the uh, presentations. Uh, so, so, okay. So, I'm going to skip through. I, okay. Now, what, one thing people would say is, wait a minute, well, you look, you're putting electrodes at the outside, you really don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's noise, maybe it's something else. So there, so there is a way around this, uh, and that is we can go ahead and actually put the electrode into this region. So remember now, at this point, we think we know where we're looking. We think we're, we need to be in this posterior region in auditory cortex to look for this early integration. So let's go stick an electrode in to the brain and see if we can actually record And then that would be ground truth. You can't argue with that. The electrode's actually in the area and so on. So, so here we have um, non-human primates, and we're passing the electrode down into this posterior auditory region, and we're asking what happens when we stimulate with auditory or somatosensory information. And we've, by the way, we've done this in humans as well who are undergoing intracranial mapping for epilepsy, so we can go in and put electrodes into the human brain occasionally. Um, and so now, again, a little bit of neuroanatomy. One of the things here is, that this is, so this is cortex, these are the cells, um, this is the granular cell layer, well, what, what does that mean? There's about two millimeters of cortex, the gray matter, you've all heard about the gray matter. And what happens is, it's arranged in layers, layers one to six, from the top to the bottom. And uh, we know from doing tracer analysis, by putting dyes into the brain and so on, we know what those layers mean. And what the, it is, is the case is that this layer four here is actually where information flows up into. It goes in there first before it gets passed up to the superior and down to the inferior areas, where it gets passed up that chain and back down that chain of regions. So information coming into layer four is feed forward, and information coming into these upper layers and lower layers is typically feedback. So we can make this very simple uh, distinction. And that allows us to ask something about the timing and where the information flow is coming from. Okay, now I know that's a little tricky, but it, it'll get a little easier to understand now. So what we do is we pass this electrode. Now remember, it's two millimeters of space here. So this is a pretty spectacular piece of machinery here that, that a, a girl in our lab, Shirley, spends about three weeks building one of these electrodes. And oftentimes when she finishes the three weeks, the electrode doesn't work and she starts again. It's, it's very, very fine work. Um, and so what happens is these are electrode contacts on this little needle electrode where the distance between each one of these contacts is 150 microns. Remember, all of these contacts are across two millimeters. This is precision work. And that allows us to record the, uh, the activity across the layers and ask, do we see activity in layer four or is it in the infragranular or supergranular layers? So we have this electrode sitting in this auditory region. So this is an area where you expect to find auditory inputs. Now, don't sweat the details here, but here's what you can see. This is voltage. Look at the time here, 10, 15 milliseconds in layer four. And this is because we're stimulating with auditory input. So this creature is pushing a button so you can get some juice or some M&Ms, whatever he likes. Uh, and we see that when we present an auditory stimulus, we get lots and lots of firing in this layer four. These are actually multi-units. This is the neurons going pip, 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 just firing off. And there it is, layer four, you can see it. So, okay, so, well, that's no big surprise. We're, we're in a region that's one synapse, one connection away from the very first auditory region, and so it should be responding like crazy to auditory input. So that's, that's a uh, sanity check there. But look what's happening when we present the somatosensory input. So if we go ahead and use one of these little stimulators, it doesn't matter, we can, we can play with the whiskers on the face, you name it, we get input to layer four. So this region that was classically an auditory region. Remember Jones and Powell. This region has no business responding to somatosensory inputs. And there it is, responding away like crazy. We can take, um, just to show you what the other pattern looks like. So here we are in another penetration through that area. There's the layer four activity to an auditory input. But if we use a visual stimulus this time, look at layer four, it's silent. No input. But look at this. It has this input much later in time 
to the supergranular, infragranular layer. So this is an area one synapse away from auditory cortex, and it shows both patterns. It's getting information in the feed-forward way from the auditory system, so it should be, but also from the somatosensory system. But it's also getting, well, pretty quick. I mean, this is 50 milliseconds. It's getting feedback input from the visual system into these uh, other layers. So very dynamic and very fast. 50 milliseconds, this is an area that's receiving all three sensory inputs. Um, just to give you a sense of where it is, we can reconstruct this in MR space. Uh, and so this is the audit, primary auditory area. So this is the back of the brain. You can see it's a simpler brain than ours. Um, down along the temporal plane. So just down here above the ear. Um, so when we look at all the electro penetrations where we find multisensory responses, here we are one synapse away from primary auditory cortex. So this was, this finally people stopped screaming at us, which was nice. Um, and what we, what we were able to say is, indeed, there are areas in early sensory cortex that are already integrating multisensory inputs at the very beginning of processing. So that, that was a paradigm shift and it really turned the field on its head, if you like. Now, the next thing people got hot on the collar about was, wait a minute, you've been doing all of this stuff with auditory and somatosensory inputs. That's got to be a special case. Maybe audiovisual inf information doesn't work this way. Uh, so, of course, we, we, we moved on to testing that. Now, I'm going to show you um, some of these slides I made this morning. They may be a little, <laughs> a little hokey. Um, I'm going to show you some, some, a study that we did in humans now. And, uh, I'm going to, and you're going to have to stick with me here and understand this very simple concept of multisensory speeding. So, so let me see if I can demonstrate that. So we don't need this slide. So, okay. So if I put you in our lab, I put a lot of electrodes on you, and I said to you, okay, I want you to stare at the computer screen, I have a set of headphones on you, and every now and again a red flash is going to show up here, and I want you to push a button as quickly as you can to it. And so it might look something like that. And you would, here's 362 milliseconds, I made this up this morning, it's not real. Um, so you push the button pretty quickly, that's pretty good going, and that's about what people do. And I could also then say, play the pip to you, and you push the button to that, and you have a reaction time. So, so, uh, so that's all very well. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing I can do is uh, I can present them together and you push the button. And what are you pushing the button to? Well, you're pushing the button to the combination of the two of them. But it's entirely possible that the button push that you just made was purely to the visual one or purely to the auditory one, right? You don't have to do any integration. And one of the key things here is, right, in the first scenario you only had one stimulus copy to make a response to. But in this second scenario, you have both. And so it's a bit like getting two rolls of a dice to hit to get a six, right? It's, it's a, you've got this probability uh, summation issue. So, so by rights, whenever two events occur, you should get faster because one or the other of them has a, better, has a chance of kicking off a fast reaction. So we, we call this the redundant sensory effect, or redundant target effect. It doesn't have to be just across the senses. So, so two events occur in two different modalities. You're going to speed up. And uh, that might look like something like this. So, so if, we, if I said, I presented that visual stimulus to you a couple of hundred times. And here, look, this person, this is, you know, uh, Joe Computer. And he's got a sort of average reaction time in this 350 millisecond range. And so sometimes he's much faster. There's always a few outliers. And sometimes he's slower. And so he's got a distribution, right? So this is a count. How many times did he kick off reaction time in this bin versus that? So this is, this is the bell curve. This is a normal distribution. And by and large, reaction times look a little bit like that. There's some nuances. And so uh, I could do the same thing then with the auditory stimulus, show him uh, a couple of hundred of those, and he'd have a distribution. And again, the point is if both of them show together, there's a better chance then that you're going to see a faster response. So I can put those two distributions over each other, and then I can ask this question. What happens when I, when I present the two together? And if I present the two together, and it's just a question of summation of the distributions, well, then you just get an average of this. So you get some speeding up, but, but it wouldn't... Be. So, so then you say, okay, what happens when I present the multi-sensory event, when I present the two together, really present the two together? How did he or she respond? And maybe you'll end up with something like this. And so now you can see but the distribution's shifted, right? See, the average is kind of down here rather than back here for the two unisensory ones. And so you can see the zone here where there are lots of very fast reaction times to a multisensory event 
that can't really be predicted on the basis of the unisensory events. Okay, that's a, that's a simple concept. We call this, it's, a, it's got a nice name, it's called a race model. So it's essentially the idea that you have two, two copies of, name, of, of stimuli coming into the system, and they're kind of racing through the system, each one with an equal chance to kick off a reaction time. And so if you have violation of the simple race model, then you have clear evidence that something integrative must have happened in the brain to improve performance. That's the key point here. And so we can really use this very, very simple measure. It couldn't really get simpler than this. To a beep and a flash, how fast is somebody to respond to this? And so, so this is what it looks like in adults. So here's, for example, this is real data now, or these are real data. So here's uh, a visual stimulus, exactly the one I just showed you, simple red flash, and on average people responded about 300 milliseconds or so. And there's the auditory tone that you just heard, that little tone pip, and people respond a teeny bit faster, but there's no real difference there. And look, when they, when they both come together, they get much faster. But I've already said, right, there, you're going to get faster. The question is, is this much faster than is predicted by the race model? And the way we plot this is we just say, tell me, going back here, if I take this zone here, how many of the reaction times, or what percentage of the reaction times in the multicentric event simply can't be predicted by race model? Well, we can plot that here. And so here's 20, about 25% of the reaction times here. It's any time you see, so this, you, you're going to get, need to get used to this plot. Any time you see this violation here going above zero, we're just asking, there's 25 to 30% of the reaction times are too fast to be predicted by probability summation. So that's the key concept. So here's typical ad, neurotypical adults, and they're really speeding up. They're getting a great benefit out of having a multisensory event out there. And so, for example, things like this are actually being used in, in cars to help people brake quicker and so on. And, and, and you know, it's a nice little uh, behavioral uh, benefit. So, so we've, done, we've done this study uh, quite extensively. And I mentioned then that people said, well, look, you know, auditory somatosensory integration may be a special case. So we did this with the electrodes again, and we asked, when do we see the difference between when the audiovisual stuff shows up together or if we just add the auditory and the visual uh, information? And here again, it's voltage. This is just a single electrode out of all of those electrodes sitting back over visual cortex, right, which is at the back of the head. Here's time going by. There's zero. That's when the stimulus came on. It takes actually about 40 milliseconds, 40 to 50 milliseconds, for information to arrive back in visual cortex because it has quite a long way to travel from the retina, it goes down into the thalamus, then it shows up in area V1. That takes about 45 or 50 milliseconds. So, you know, just a little neurophilosophy. Everything you see before you right now has already happened, right? Because your system is a little bit slower than real time. Everything, everything we, we think is happening in real time is actually uh, considerably far gone. That's, that's only when afferents occurs, actually. By the time, it takes us about 150 to 200 milliseconds to really extract any meaningful object information. So almost two-tenths of a second. We're, we're on, on a delayed loop, if you like, so, uh, which is quite something to think about. Um, so, so here, anyway, is when I add up the auditory and the visual response, the blue one, and you can see the red one, there's a clear difference there. If we just make a difference, uh, subtract these two, and map it, you can see that there's evidence for very early integration. Basically, the minute, the moment that visual information shows up in visual cortex, it's already being shaped by the auditory input, the concurrent auditory input. And again, this has sort of been borne out in many, many studies since then and with intracranial recordings and so on. So I just show it to, sh to show you that just how unbelievably rapid multisensory integration is in the brain. Now, this was, uh, what happened was then in 2001, uh, I was in San Diego at the Society for Neuroscience meeting and some new tracers had come on the market. So here, remember good old Jones and Powell uh, very restricted and entirely separate fields, chiefly in their immediate vicinity. Uh, it's a, for those of you who write science, don't, don't use the words entirely separate and restricted. Just you know, be a little less categorical. I find, find that a good rule in my own writing. Uh, but Kathy Rockland, who was working in Japan at the Riken, and, and this is Arno Falchier, who was working with Dave Kennedy at Anserm in Paris, had just begun to use these new tracers, BDA. And what did they find? They found connections between early auditory and visual cortices. So these are actually stained neurons. This is a neuron in area V2 where the stain was injected into A1, into the first auditory area, miles away in cortex, miles away. And the information, there was clear monosynaptic connections between those areas. So that was the first evidence. So you can imagine we were quite relieved. You know, we've been sort of getting quite some grief about this uh, to find that indeed there, there were these connections. 
Now, the next argument people made was that the connections, oh, it's just a few spare neurons left over from neural pruning during childhood. So Dave Kennedy went back and quantified the, the connection. The connection between these early auditory and visual areas was equal to the connection between area V4 and V1. For those of you who know, V4 is that's the motion detection area in cortex. And so the connection between V4 and V1 is a very prominent connection. And this connection is just as prominent. And that, so, that, so there was the evidence that, in fact, there was very, very close communication between early sensory regions right from the get-go. There's neuroanatomic evidence, timing evidence, intracranial evidence. So, so that became somewhat incontrovertible, and then that changed the thinking. Now, that's key because, of course, when you're thinking about clinical populations, you'd like to think that this long-range early connectivity, which could be very vulnerable, for example, to developmental changes, would or might or might not be there. So it's a good target uh, system when you go to clinical studies. Now, if we look at uh, neurotypical children... Uh, and we ask that simple question. If I just present auditory and visual information together, do you speed up? Now, if you think, think about this, if audio, audiovisual information, simple flashes and tones, and you try to think to just intuitively, when, when would children develop this ability? You know, we think about critical periods and two-year-olds and three-year-olds, surely this is all over and done with for something so simple. Uh, uh, while the kids are infants and toddlers, or certainly by the time they go to school. Well, but it turns out it's not true at all. Here are seven, eight, nine-year-old neurotypical kids, smart kids. And they show, remember they, I told you that it's only when you see this violation above, above the line. So eight-year-olds derive no benefit whatsoever in terms of you know, this one task, just speeded, speeded button pushes from audiovisual information. In fact, we don't see it until ten, reliably until 10 or 11 or 12 years of age. So, and then it really only becomes adult-like when kids are well into their teens. So, so this is quite extraordinary, really, because this is not how we think about development of, of abilities in children. But this very, very fundamental multisensory integration is t- has, a, has a really extended developmental trajectory, and that's quite surprising, and it will be meaningful, because what happens, for example, now, if we ask this question of, children who are high-functioning and on the autism spectrum. So these are kids with, 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 uh, with completely within normal IQs, uh, but they have full ADOS, ADI for the aficionados uh, diagnosis of an autism spectrum uh, condition. And so, uh, so here's, in this case, TD means typically developing, neurotypical kids. And so, and young here is eight, nine, ten-year-olds. And so you can see they're just beginning to show the evidence of race violation, but if you look at the same age kids on the spectrum, no evidence whatsoever of that. Now here are the teenagers, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And so there you see that you know, the best part of 35, 40% of the reaction times to a multisensory event are, are faster than they should be. And look at the, the uh, teenage children with the autism spectrum. So they're starting to show something, but there's nothing actually reliably there statistically. In fact, if you look at it, they look just like these guys, just numerically. So there's about, this actually amounts to about a six-year delay in these kids on the spectrum. Now, these are kids who learn to read. There's nothing remarkable about these children in terms of their sensory profiles, if you like. Uh, but, but they haven't developed this particular ability. Uh, and so, so that may be meaningful. We'll come back to it. How am I doing on time here? That is it. Okay, I'm going to skip right through one section here because I think, I think this piece will be more interesting. So, I want to do... Uh, this is class participation time. Uh, so, wake up. We should do it with a seventh inning stretch. We don't have that in Ireland, but it's done. So, so I'm going to ask uh, for a little bit of participation here. And so, here's what's going to happen. This, this is Harry McGurk. Uh, I, show of hands, those of you who know the McGurk effect is. Good. So not everybody. That's good. So keep quiet. Don't say words. So, um, so here's what I'm going to ask uh, you to do. I, for, so everybody to my left, to your right, from here over, uh, in a moment I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Uh, and everybody over here, keep your eyes open and keep them trained on Harry. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Now it takes me a while to get settled in here. I only The video's poor quality, but it's from the 1980s. But I like to use it because this is, this is the guy himself. And you'll see why he became a very important person in multisensory science. 
So watch Harry, and now you guys are going to close your eyes. It's going to get a little noisy. So eyes closed over there. No cheating. And those of you over here, same question, same or different? You know, I live in fear that this will fail. <laughs> so, so thank you for complying. So, so, so let's reverse it. Why, why not, right? Let's reverse it. You guys keep your eyes open. Look at Harry. No, nothing up the sleeves or anything. It's a computer. It um, and we'll, we'll play him again. Okay, now, so he's going to start up again. And this time you guys close your eyes. And you guys keep your eyes open. I mean, is it different or same? Um, okay, so, so well, I'll tell you exactly what's going on. Uh, and it sounds like most of you actually know. Uh, he only ever says ba. It's always ba. It's not just always ba, it's always exactly the same ba. Because the ba is looped on. So there's no variance at all. It's always ba. And of course what he's doing is he's mouthing different things. Ga, ba, da. And uh, that it, there's some pretty extraordinary aspects to this. So for example, when he goes ba, you hear ba. Uh, every, anybody who's a native English speaker, uh, fully, like originally, will hear ba very strongly. It, it gets a little weaker if, it's, if it, English is your second language and so on. Um, but it works in every other language. You can, I can make phonemes for Finnish and it'll work. Um, so, so you hear ba. But there are cases, for example, where he's going uh, uh, da and the thing is going ba or ga and the thing is going ba and you hear da. So now you, now you are perceiving something that was neither in the visual or the auditory input. And so, so why am I showing you this? Apart from the, you know, it's a good time to get you guys a little bit of exercise. Um, but but what, it's, what it's giving you is insight into how intrinsically linked our auditory perceptual quality. The, the we, we still think we're hearing this. But actually, we're believing our eyes. In so many cases, we're, we're buying what the eyes are telling us more than we are the auditory system. And so on. so it, it, it should be giving you some insight into how intrinsically linked our sense of what we hear, particularly with regard to speech, is to, to what we see. And actually, I can make the same thing happen with somatosensory inputs and so on. So it's just give it, it's a little window. It's a little illusion, illusory window. So, so when does it matter? I mean, and obviously, I'm, I'm sure you all can figure this out. Um, you know, if you go someplace noisy what's going on in front of you in the face and in the lips becomes very important. Like pubs. Now see, I can say this here in Ireland and everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. But it's, it's, it's often a little tricky for an Irish guy to stand up in front of an international audience and talk about the pub. <laughs> <laughs> the racial stereotype have busy living up to it. Um, so, there you go. That's okay in Boston. It's okay in New York too, I have to say. Uh, so, okay. So, so you're gonna, it's going to get noisy again and there's a word. Sim- simple word. See if you can recognize it. Don't shout it out. 
So there's a word in there. Uh, but watch Vicky here and see uh, it's the same word, same amount of noise. You feel it pop, right? You really feel it pop. So, so the word is in there. Maybe you guys could get it. The word's game. But once you get the visual, that's exactly the same noise, but it, it, really, it really comes out. Oh, sorry. We'll do one more. Right, it puts all the corners and edges back onto that sound. Right? But the sound, it's not your auditory system that's doing that. It's your visual system that's giving you that. And so this is really crucial, right? Speech and noise. Now, so, so when do we need this? Well, you know, it's fine in here when everybody's being very, very polite, at least for now. Uh, and staying, staying nice and quiet, and the acoustics are decent and so on. So you guys could close your eyes, please don't, um, and you still, you still have a relatively high fidelity auditory <coughs> input. But, but you know, think about the classroom. Think about out here in the lobby uh, when the coffee's going on. Think about on the street when you're walking down. I mean, really, most of the time, we're uh, operating in relatively noisy environments. Um, so here's, uh, let's do some data, and this is quite simple to follow, but uh, let me just unpack it. You're going to see a bunch of plots like this. So, so zero here is the case where you, you just did the experiment that I'm going to start, describe the data for. So zero here actually means that we present the words. There are about almost 600 monosyllabic words in the English lexicon. The great thing about monosyllabic words is kids know them. They're the simple words, right? Dog, cat, brush, you name it. Uh, and they're very easy to repeat, which is all we ask people to do. And so zero decibels means that we're presenting the words, just like you heard them, at about 50 de decibels, uh, which is a, just a loudness, moderate loudness. And then we actually add that pink noise that in the back at exactly 50 decibels. So, so in fact, already zero, that means then the ratio is noise to signal, sorry. Zero means that there's as much noise as there is signal. And in this curve here, you see that even when there's as much noise as signal, neurotypical adults, these are adults, will recognize 75-80% of the words, which is remarkable. I mean, humans are amazing at this. I mean, this is as much noise as signal. And then if we turn the noise off, so now the noise is greater than the signal. By rights, we shouldn't be recognizing anything. Uh, there's more noise than signal, and we still manage this. We still manage to be pretty good. But we can keep doing it, so we keep turning the noise off. So minus 8 means it's now the noise is 8 decibels higher than the signal. Or you can turn the signal down, it doesn't matter. And bit by bit, you can move it to the point where at minus 24 decibels, there's half as much noise again as there is signal. You Not a single human being can recognize a single word at that point. It's gone. So, we, so it's, this is what we call a very nice psychometric function. This is very well behaved curve here. Uh, and so now let's throw the video track back in. You guys just did this. And you can see performance really jumps up. So, I mean, there's some pretty remarkable stuff here. Remember, the auditory system had absolutely no ability here whatsoever to recognize a single thing. And you throw in the video track and you're almost up to 20%. One in five words now you can recognize fully, faithfully, exactly the words. So, I mean, this is pretty amazing. And, uh, but you'll, I think what you'll notice too is that, look at this point here, minus 12 decibels. It's going to become an important point for us. This, if I go out and I take a sound level meter and I go into standard environments where people speak, like cafeterias and so on. This is a number that keeps coming up. It's kind of a little bit of a magic number in the multi-sensory world. Um, and so look what happens here. When it's auditory alone, 20%. One in five words. One in five words, you can't understand what somebody's saying. Throw the video track in, now you're up to 65, 70%. Three in five words, four in five words, now you understand. You, you fill the rest in on terms of context. So this is the difference between completely unintelligible and pretty much complete intelligibility. So this is important. So if I just do something really simple, like again, complex maths for tonight, I'm going to subtract this from this. And that's what I get, this curve. And you can see it's got a nice tuning function. It's got a peak there at minus 12 decibels. By the way, that's what lip reading is. We're rubbish at lip reading. <laughs> Typical people, 6, 7, 8%. Oh, occasionally we'll find somebody who's off the charts at this, but we, we're terrible at it. So, so, it's, so this sort of thing, for example, is not explained by lip reading. It's multi-sensory integration. Okay, so that's what adults look like. Now, here's what kids look like. And remember, I, I, I was belaboring this point that when you just ask people to push buttons, the simplest thing in the world, the kids show this very long developmental trajectory. So maybe you're not going to be surprised that when it comes to this speech and noise study, it's somewhat similar. So here are eight, six, seven-year-olds, that black trace there, 
in the order tree alone. Now we have a no noise condition here, that means there's no noise at all. But you can see the same kind of psychometric. So, so you know, six and seven year olds aren't quite as good as 11 and 12 year olds, and they're definitely not as good as adults. But, so there's some separation there. But look what happens when we put the video track in. So there's the adults, 11 year olds, six and seven year olds. So if we do the same subtraction, take away the auditory loan from the audio visual, and we come up with the tuning function. So here's the adults again, look at the minus 12 with the tuning peak. Six and seven year olds, less than half the gain. Look at the 11 year olds. They're, they're nowhere near adult levels of multisensory speech integration. So the next time you're shouting at the kids, why aren't you listening to me? Why won't you hear what I'm saying? Just bear this curve in mind here. Maybe there's something else going on. It might not be their fault. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> now you're feeling guilty, I hope. No. <laughs> so, so, okay. So let's take, so we've got a good, we've got a nice design here. We know about the normal development, if you like. Uh, I don't like to use the word normal. We know what neurotypical kids, regular kids, are doing uh, in terms of this. And we see this protracted developmental, uh, uh, protracted uh, trajectory, developmental trajectory is the word I'm looking for. So let's have a look in, in children on the spectrum. Now, now, why would we do that? Well, one obvious one is that AV speech perception is important for communication. I probably didn't need to tell you that, and you just saw lots of reasons why it is. And of course, impairment in communication is a hallmark symptom in the autism spectrum conditions. Um, and actually, this idea of sensory integration deficits has been around for a very long time. And I, many of you may know about these books by Jane Eyre's and uh, Kantrovitz and so on, The Out of Sync Child. There's always been this notion about that there may be some issue with the way the senses are integrated in autism. And I, I, I used to say uh, that, uh, so, so, and in fact, one of the primary things people do with their kids is they bring them to sensory integration therapy and so on. And so, uh, and I used to say it was like sort of a, a cottage industry, but it's actually much more like a military industrial complex now in terms of delivery of sensory integration therapies. Uh, and that's great, you know, therapy's great, but the, the, the key here is like, we, we had no evidence whatsoever in the literature, up until a few years ago, that there was any sensory integration deficit in autism at all. So here we are treating symptoms without any empirical evidence that there's something wrong. So, so, so hopefully there is something wrong, which is a peculiar way to be thinking about it. Uh, but people are spending millions and millions of dollars on this. So, so let's, take our, let's take our design. So, so here are seven, eight, and nine-year-old children on the spectrum and neurotypically matched. So they're matched for everything. IQs, age, socioeconomic status, race, you name it. They're, all, they're matched on all of those parameters. And actually, there's something quite extraordinary here. This is auditory alone. And look at these children, uh, young children on the spectrum. And they're absolutely no worse at this auditory alone task than the neurotypical kids. Let's throw the video track in. And you can see where this is going. So we do our simple... Uh, high-level math subtraction here and pull out those gain curves. Here are the neurotypical children. Remember, they, they're, they're all, they, these are six, seven-year-olds, so they're not really show, or seven, eight-year-olds. They have a very immature multisensory speech integration system relative to adults. But even so, the children on the spectrum are really hammered on this. So it can't be anything to do with attention. It's not that they're more susceptible to noise. They're operating just fine with regards to the background noise when it comes to auditory loan inputs. But boy, when you put those things together, they are not getting the same benefit. Same IQ levels. Same IQ levels. Same matched on everything. They're so not very high functional, high IQ. Yeah. These children are high functioning children on the spectrum. So which means that, that they have the same performance IQs as neurotypical children. Uh, many of them actually have superior. So, so of course, we, we, we have a number of outliers in our autism group where their IQs are off the charts, like we've never seen. Uh, but they're severely impaired, if you like, uh, with regard to the spectrum condition that's underlying. Now, okay, let's move up the age brackets. So we have 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. There's auditory alone performance. You can see really no difference, maybe a teeny bit of difference in the children on the spectrum throw the video track in, and now you know the punchline here, and indeed, these children, pre-teen children, have a severe multisensory integration deficit. This is the kind of thing you can pull out at the individual participant level. What happens when they get into their teenage years? 
and we fully expect much the same kind of pattern. They're starting to show a little bit of a difference in the auditory alone, but not much, not much. Throw the video track in. What? Do your subtraction. And the deficit is gone away. Deficit's gone away. Something pretty dramatic happened here. You saw how dramatically impaired these children were uh, up until 12 years of age. And then for some reason, and I'm not going to be able to give you any kind of a reasonable answer for this. I'd be very interested in your thoughts on it. By 13, 14 years of age, these kids have recovered fully their multisensory integration deficit. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, go, I'm going to beg your indulgence and, and the, because I want to get through a few more slides and I'm absolutely happy to talk about all of this afterwards at length. But, uh, Very short. Yes. Um, these are um, different kids. Uh, it's a cross, age groups cross-sectional well, study. Them over Ab- over absolutely over. crucial point. These are, it's a cross-sectional study. Okay. Cross-sectional study. That means that we, we have different bunches of children. We, we haven't waited around for seven years for kids to go through this whole thing. It's very, very difficult to do. We are doing that right now. And we're targeting, you'll see, we're targeting very specific age brackets because, because it's quite dramatic. Right? You see how it is in the previous slide. There's a severe deficit, 10, 11, 12, and then 13, 14, 15, it's gone. Pardon? Yeah, you'll see. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't pay him. <laughs> so, okay, so, so this is what data behind those things look like. And don't sweat this. This is a little intense. Uh, but the thing, to put, the thing to look at down here, let's look at this. This is the AV gain. So these are individual, individuals, every individual. So, so, of course, this is the dirty secret that's hidden behind everybody's data. But there's a lot of variance here. But you can clearly see the red dots are the children on the spectrum and the blue dots are the neurotypicals. And you, if you just do a little regression, you can see what's happening here is that there's some kind of a catch-up function going on in the autistic children. They start out very impaired, and then they catch up. But it's, it's not as simple as that, because this is not a linear relationship. Because if you, if we go, so this is by months here. And if I go in and just average each single year, as, as you suggested, you can see what happens is that the, the <coughs> deficit is there 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then it changes. Now it gets a little noisy here, but we've th- since filled this in. Something really dramatic happens between 12 and 13 years of age. Uh, now, of course, they enter puberty, and there's, uh, well, we, let's come back to that. Now, okay, let's, let me do a little prophylaxis here on some of the potential criticisms. This, this paper is uh, out already in the literature. Uh, the first thing anybody would ask is, well, wait a minute. This is all predicated on people looking at faces. And we all know that folks on the spectrum don't like to look at faces. So how have you guys accounted for that? So what happens is they, these, we use an infrared eye tracking system, a very sophisticated one that follows them literally millisecond by millisecond. And uh, rather remarkably, we, we fully expected to have to sort the data based on where the children were looking at, at at, and we fully expected the children on the spectrum, given whatever we thought, to be a little less faithful in terms of looking at the face. And we found absolutely no difference whatsoever. There's 240 children here, so this is not you know, some little sampling bias or that. Um, no difference whatsoever in their abilities, will, or anything to look at the face. We don't tell them anything. We don't say, you must look at the face. We put them in the booth, we tell them what the task is, and then they do what they do. What we do is we measure where they're looking, and they were looking exactly the same place as neurotypical folks. Actually, it's interesting where people look. What they typically do is look to the right side of the mouth of the speaker, God knows why, and to the right eye, to the bridge of the nose here. So there's a real sort of zone, hot zone here, and it's exactly the same hot zone in individuals on the spectrum. Now, um, okay. Let me show you some physiology really quickly here. Here are, um, I'm, I'm skipping back to just simple beats and flashes. Um, these are, so this is, these are children, seven to eight to nine years of age. And remember that they weren't responding, they weren't showing this multisensory integration deficit, or uh, benefit. And so these are just a few electrodes on the scalp. And the red trace here is when I add up the auditory and the visual response. And the black trace is when the two came together. And I think what you'll notice here is that by and large, there's not that much difference between these traces. In fact, there's really not much difference at all. And what difference there is, 
occurs quite late. Remember before we were seeing things at 50 milliseconds and very early in the, in the event. Look here, for example, there's just a, a faint hint of it. So we don't see the integration until very late in these seven, eight, nine year olds. Now, I'm not going to go through all the, the ages here in the interest of time, but look what it looks like in an adult. You see? So this is the same thing. So now you see the divergence between the, the black and the red. See how different that is? Okay, so, so seven, eight, nine year olds the, both behaviorally and electrophysiologically, don't show this mature multisensory pattern. So if we, we uh, really winnow in here uh, at one of these components, I'm not, again, I'm not going to s- s- sweat exactly where this is, but this is a, this is a, a response that's coming out of uh, early parietal multisensory regions. So here are eight year olds, and look what happens here. When this is the artificial response, adding AV and comparing it to the two when they come together. And you can see the red is bigger than the black. Eight-year-olds. Ten, eleven-year-olds. You see how it's flipped around? Now the multisensory is bigger than the unisensory sums. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen-year-olds, it's bigger again, and it's moving earlier in time, and there's the adult, right? So you can see how it's flipping over. This flipping over here correlates with the changes in the multisensory speed. So this is the underlying physiological reason why we're getting this change in speed. You can see it growing in, if you like, again, cross-sectional. Now, what happens when we look at children on the spectrum? Remember, skip to that. Remember what happened here, right? We had our, our nine-year-olds that were TD, and they were just beginning to show this multisensory speeding. There's the teenagers and young, youngsters showing this large speeding, not so much in the, in the uh, autism spectrum. So this is a little bit complicated slide, but you really... So, what I have up here in this corner are the young typically developing. So they're 10, 11 years of age. So there you see the multisensory response is just beginning to be bigger than the unisensory response. Just there. And then you move to the older neurotypicals and there it is getting quite early and, and robust. Look at the ASD children. No evidence for it in the young and no evidence for it in the teenagers. See that? So the, so the brain is not wired up yet for this particular process. Simple thing. Pushing a button to auditory and visual inputs. Leonor, how am I doing on time? Ten minutes. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Okay. This is the last part of the talk. I'm going to flip. I'm going to switch to a different disorder here, or different condition. Dyslexia. It's not that different. So, and again, I'm going to do this business of trying to show you how we map out the basic function first and then apply those measures in a, in a, a clinical population. So now we're going to change to hemodynamic imaging. Um, now, even in neurotypical adults, when we look at this performance in sin, I don't know, maybe we should change that. This, this is speech and noise. It's not the other kind. Um, when we look at performance in that, remember this study... There's auditory alone, there's audiovisual integration. And so, and there's the gain curve. And so what if I just go and say, let me just average those four noise things there. And I've come up with a single number that quantifies audiovisual gainability in these neurotypical adults. What would that look like? So here we go, audiovisual gain. I'm going to ask how all of those 60 people are rate. And it's quite extraordinary. It's a normally distributed thing, but there are super integrators, people who are absolutely extraordinary at this. And then there are people walking around without any condition. This is no, these people don't have autism or who are absolutely pathetic at this. They have almost no multisensory integration abilities. Actually, there's 60 people here. That means that there are a couple of people in this room, maybe me, <laughs> who look just like this. And there are a few people up there who, uh, you know, it wouldn't matter what, we, we could bring Aerosmith in here, you'd still be able to hear my talk. So, um, so, so, so this is quite nice. This is, this is kind of a, a, a dream for a scientist, to have this kind of distribution of data, because now we can ask some very interesting questions. Oops. Now, let me, I'm going to come back to it. Let me, let me skip on here. I'm going to talk a little bit about multisensory circuits. So we happen to know some stuff about what parts of the brain are really key for doing this multisensory speech integration. Uh, and, you know, here, here's, here's, uh, this is called the superior temporal sulcus. It's the, it's the going in part. 
This is the superior temporal gyrus. Remember I told you all of auditory cortex is kind of the, the early areas are buried in there on the sy sylvian fissure, on the supratemporal plane. And this region here is very important for speech and multisensory, or speech integration and multisensory speech integration. Some of you may have heard about Wernicke's area. So for example, if there was a stroke or a bullet wound or something that took out this area back here, you'd be absolutely rubbish at receptive speech. Be, in fact, you wouldn't have any receptive speech, depending on how big the lesion is. So this is a key hub. And again, you mentioned that we're in the left hemisphere. It's all about the left hemisphere when it comes to speech and language. So this is the posterior superior temporal gyrus. So that's our little, very brief, very simple neuroanatomy lesson. These are key areas, and that's going to be coming important. Now, what we're going to do now is take all those adults that we have this measure of their multisensory integration, speech integration, and we're going to stick them in one of these things, and we're going to ask, what does their multisensory speech integration look, network look like? So how do we do that? So we have a, an experiment uh, where this very nice lady uh, is an actress, very, very good actress, actually. Uh, and she comes into the lab, and we made a videotape of her reading the Lorax, which is a fantastic story because adults and kids all like the Lorax. Who doesn't like the Lorax? Uh, and we made a very, very high quality video, audio video version of this, and then we broke it uh, badly. And this is what, it, what happens is we have periods, short little periods, while the folks are in the magnet, where it's just the soundtrack, and then some short little periods where it's just her, and she's incredibly expressive. She's like really like a master at telling a story. Uh, and then this periods where, where it's completely faithful, it's, it's synchronous, audio-visual track is coming together. And I, then every now and again, the audio track gets out of whack with the visual track. It's like, you know, when you want to go punch the TV to get the thing back in, and it's a little disconcerting, but it's only 500 milliseconds, half a second, and actually, this is quite tolerable. You just kind of have the sense that there's something wrong with the track. It's... Uh, so, and so what happens is this thing is just going along and these little periods are showing up and so it just kind of comes across like a bit of a crappy video. It's like these guys don't really know what they're doing when it comes to making videos. But you can follow the story just fine. Uh, and then what we tell them is afterwards we're going to ask you some questions about the, about the story and if you respond well we'll give you gift cards to Target. Mm -hmm. Cleary. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. And then we can ask some really simple questions. So, so we can ask some basic stuff uh, which is what you've been, we've been doing all along. Remember the, the high-level math here. We say, what happens if we just add up the auditory and the visual response and compare it to the, to the audio-visual response? Do we see areas that light up? And we do. We see huge swaths of the cortex. So here's, this is auditory cortex. We're slicing through this, the front, the back. And we're sort of slicing through the middle here, right through auditory cortex. And we see all of auditory cortex active and visual cortex too. And loads and loads of regions that I've stepped up through this. And so if I slice in from the side here to the left, I think that's that superior temporal jar. So you can see the whole thing is involved in this. And then I can ask, uh, if you like, mine in now. Now we're saying, what happens when there's both audio-visual cases, so there's auditory and visual inputs coming in, but, the, but what's the difference between the cases where it's synchronous and a little asynchronous? And now, of course, the map winnows down. And th so this is, uh, it turns out that there are two regions here at the very anterior tip of the, uh, anterior tip of the superior temporal gyrus that are s exquisitely sensitive to this synchrony. And that's, a, that's actually quite a new finding. People, we weren't aware of this until a few weeks ago. So, no, the amygdala is, on the in, uh, is further down and in the, in the middle temporal lobes. So, so this, is like, this is neocortex, and it's a part of really anterior, so sort of almost like an on the, these areas of the anterior temporal lobe, we don't know a whole ton about what they do. They're definitely high-level processing semantic processing, cross-sensory categorization. We don't really know too much about them. But one thing they definitely seem to care about is the synchrony in the audiovisual track uh, of speech. Okay. They're, they're late in the development of the brain, in the evolution of the brain. One, well, one would think so. That's a good, yeah, good point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although, well, it's a bigger, I think we're going to have to talk about that. It's a bigger question. I mean, the, the, this is, this is new, new cortex and the anterior temporal lobes are probably part of phylogenetically or later development, if that's what you mean, evolutionarily. Um, but still, you know, I mean, this is the synchrony in speech. Now, <laughs> I mean, how many times uh, would uh, proto-man, up until uh, we had video tracks, be able to, to 
to see out of sync auditory and visual speech information, not at all, right? Ever. So this is quite an artificial stimulus. Well, far, far, who, who said far away? Yeah, right. But even still, if you take uh, sound as a meter per second, basically. So even at 40 meters, you'd be talking 40 milliseconds. This is 500 milliseconds. It's really highly artificial. Now, one way, of course, that would be out of sync is if you don't want to put together my sight with your sound or something. So those are the, that you want to be sensitive to the fact that those two signals don't go together. But anyway. Okay. So now, when, when we look at these sort of blobs, blob things, I find these uh, sort of dry and uninteresting. It's great, like, oh, yeah, these areas are involved. But we can ask some somewhat more sophisticated sophisticated questions. So, so I, I mentioned that like, we, we know that this is, this is the key area, almost certainly the key area in multisensory speech expression. So one of the things we can do is we can ask, what is it talking to exclusively when there's an audio-visual track? So we, we use these simple regression things. It's quite, there's a fancy term for it, it's like physiological interaction. But we're essentially asking, what is this area talking to when, the when there's audio-visual tracks coming together as opposed to when there's just visual or just auditory. So it's, so it's, it's, it's asking sort of a, an, and, an exclusivity map. And so, so it turns out then in, in neurotypical adults, if we ask this question, we get a pretty extraordinary swath of the brain. So again, we're asking, what is this area talking to when there's an audiovisual stream, what, but that it doesn't care to talk to when there's just auditory or just visual inputs? And it's a lot of cortex. And you can see lots of these frontal regions. But look at, look at the visual cortex. Now, maybe that's no surprise, right? What, what else would it be talking to? But it's clearly coordinating the activity between auditory and visual cortex. It's polling visual cortex for all that information. So it's sort of acting as a multi-sensory integration hub. So that's, that's key. Now, that gives us something that we can really shoot at. Um, okay. Now, remember, I have this measure of these 60 human beings that tells me something about their abilities to do multi-sensory speech integration in the environment, right? I measure that. And so uh, it's a completely different task. It was done outside the magnet days or weeks earlier, but now I know something about their ability, and I can say, what in these maps? Is there anything in these maps that, that's related to that ability that they're showing? Um, does, it, does that make sense? Okay. And so when we look at just the multisensory gain, we find, well, lo and behold, little areas back in the early visual cortex are key. The people who are really good at integrating, who show this multisensory integration gain in noise, are the people who have the highest activity in the visual cortex. Maybe that's not such a big surprise, but it's kind of nice to see it. If we look at the synchrony versus asynchrony, we say, what, what, what about those audio-visual integrators, the really good ones? Where do they show greater activity? Where do they show it? In these anterior temporal lobes. So they're the people who are driving this, this extra response there. They're the ones that are exquisitely sensitive to the synchrony versus asynchrony. So maybe it's no surprise again that they're the people who show the best abilities outside the magnet. Oops. Uh, let's, let's just keep going here. Because I want to get to... Uh, some dyslexia stuff before we run out of time. So here, now I'm going back to just the multisensory effects. There's the adult map. And here are neurotypical children. There's not too many of them here. And you see auditory cortex... And visual cortex. Okay, great. So, we, so, so neurotypical children are showing somewhat similar patterns. Now we have two types of dyslectic children here. We have a bunch of dyslectic children where they had a severe dyslexia for a substantial period of their, of their life, but they've been in, in a number of years at a very specialized school in New York. It's called a Windward School, where they've had incredibly intensive, intensive multisensory uh, therapy for their reading deficits. And they are now reading at grade level. It's not that they're reading perfectly. These are kids who, you know, you just, the minute they start reading, you know that they've had a problem. But when it comes to actually getting through the text, they can do it. So, they, so they've been remediated. So it's just, these are all between the ages of 11 and 15. Yeah, sorry. And then we have, uh, these, these numbers are much bigger actually in the slides I'll show you. Um, we have children who are the same age group now, but they are stri still show a strict dyslexia. So they have, they're severely reading impaired. And the key here is all of these kids have, I mean, the key to being diagnosed with dyslexia is that these kids have, are of normal and sometimes superior intelligence. They're completely normal intelligence. The reading is the only thing that they can't seem to master. Uh, and 
Well, it's very interesting because here is the remediated dyslexic and they're polling visual cortex. And well, you know, the numbers here are too small for us to say if that's any worse than the typically developing. But even the kids who have a strict dyslexia, when we look at the multisensory network, it looks pretty good. There's the superior temporal plane. Look, there's some visual cortex. Well, that's it. Doesn't look too bad at all. Huh. What's going on there? Maybe it's not a multisensory thing. When we ask about the congruence. Thing. So now we're mining in, right? We're asking a sort of more subtle question. There's the typically developing kids, oh. anterior temporal lobes, doing exactly the same thing as the adults, remediated oh. dyslexics, not, not as coordinated, not right at the anterior temporal lobes, but there's still evidence for it there. And then in the strict dyslexics, we found no evidence for this at all. They're not sensitive. They show no sensitive sensitivity to the synchrony business. And then when we ask this issue about what is the superior temporal gyrus doing in terms of uh, when it's reaching out, when it's coordinating multisensory activity during the speech task. There are adults, again, just to remind you, huge activation, it's pulling away at visual cortex, it's accessing like crazy visual cortex. Typically developing children, it's doing it as well, but it's very interesting, it's all in the left hemisphere. You can see that in the adults, this left superior temporal gyrus is pulling both hemispheres, but it's very unilateral in the neurotypical kids, so it's still quite immature. Remember, they really haven't achieved very good levels of multisensory integration. Remediated dyslexics. Some evidence for it. You see that there's, there's no evidence for the early visual areas. These are the earliest ones being uh, accessed. But there is beginning to be evidence that they're accessing visual cortex. But the kids who are still dyslexic have a complete absence of accessing visual cortex. There's nothing there. In fact, they have this real anteriorization. So these are, you know, again, excuse me for painting in broad strokes, but this is, these are the frontal lobes. This is the part where, you, where you're bringing cognitive resources, high-level analysis, really working, really working your brain to try and get at it. And so you can see what's going on here is this sort of notion that the typically developing kids are using the front of their brain. You've got to use the front of your brain to some degree, but they've already begun to automatize this. They've, they've sort of shifted it back into these sensory perceptual circuits. The remediated dyslexics look a bit more frontal, if you like, and they're, but they're, all, they're also showing this shift of the circuits back to sensory perceptual zones. But the strict dyslexics, it's all in the frontal lobes. So they just working their tails off to try and do this task, and they're not getting the benefit of the sort of automatic integration processes yet. So they haven't been remediated. And that brings me to the end of it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>